Open your Bibles with me, if you would, to Exodus chapter 4. We are learning from our Old Testament friend Moses how to think and live God's way. As we finish our series uh, this morning, Moses is 80 years old. Moses is talking with God in the burning bush that is not being consumed. God called and equipped Moses to go to Pharaoh and lead Israel out of bondage in Egypt. God reminded Moses that he would fulfill his covenant promise with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All Moses had to do was to go with God by faith. Instead of going with God, Moses had questions for God. The questions from Moses turned into excuses by Moses as to why he wouldn't go with God. Moses asked God, who am I, God, that I should go to Pharaoh and lead Israel out of bondage in Egypt? Moses asked God, if I go to the Israelites, God, and tell them you have sent me to them, and they ask me, what is your name? What am I supposed to say to them? God, and then Moses asked God, God, if I go to the elders of Israel, what if they don't believe me and obey me? God, in his grace, answered each question from Moses, each objection by Moses. Moses asked God a fourth question. He presented God with a fourth objection. In Exodus chapter four, look at me in verse 10. But Moses replied to the Lord, please, Lord, I've never been eloquent either in the past or recently or since you've been speaking to your servant because my mouth and my tongue are sluggish. Moses was unmoved by the three signs from God in the previous passage, Exodus 4 and verses 2 through 9 that we covered last Sunday. He was unmoved by the signs of God, the three signs of God that were meant to tell Moses, to reassure Moses that God, he was going to do what he said he was going to do. Moses was looking inward, not upward. Moses was focused on himself, not God. Moses was focused on his inability, not his availability. Moses was paralyzed by his doubts and fears. God responded to Moses in verses 11, 12. The Lord said to him, who placed a mouth on humans? Who makes a person mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will speak and I will teach you what to say. I will help you speak and I will teach you what to say. God said, who do you think you are talking with Moses? God said, I am the Lord God Almighty. I am the I am who I am, the great I am. I will help you, Moses. I will teach you what to say. God's answer to Moses should have been enough for Moses. God wanted his availability. God would bring the ability. God commanded Moses, now go, which means now go. Moses, go with me by faith. Moses responded to the Lord. In verse 13, Moses said, please, Lord, send someone else. Moses was brutally honest and open in this verse. Moses erased all doubts or questions about his thoughts in this verse. Moses did not want to go with God. Moses was polite and respectful to God. He said, please, Lord. That's the symbol of, of humility and respect to the one he's speaking to. Please, Lord, he gave Lord reverence. Please, Lord, send someone else. Please, Lord, send anyone else but me. God, I don't want to go with you. God, I don't want to obey you. God, I want my will and way, not your will and way. I like what one pastor said about this passage. He said, Moses said, here I am, God, send someone else, which is the opposite, we know, of Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah the prophet said, here I am, God, send me. God wants us to go with him by faith. God has called and equipped us to go and make disciples for Jesus. God has called and equipped us to go and bless those he puts around us. God has called and equipped us to be the hands and feet of Jesus to those he puts around us. God has called and equipped us to go and shine the light of Christ in us so that others may see our good deeds and give glory to our Father in heaven. God wants our availability. God will bring 
the ability for you and for me. This response from Moses here in verse 13 is eye-opening to us today. In spite of God's grace to Moses, in spite of God's patience with Moses, in spite of God's presence with Moses, in spite of God's promises and reassurances to Moses, in spite of God's guarantee to Moses of success for Moses in his plan for Moses, Moses said, no, God. Moses said, please, God, send someone else. God, send anyone else, not me. We, unfortunately, are like Moses at times. In spite of God's grace to us, in spite of God's patience with us, in spite of God's presence with us and in us, in spite of God's promises and reassurances to us, in spite of God's guarantee of success to us and his plan for us, we, like Moses, far too often say, no, God. God, please, please, God, send someone else. Please, God, send anyone else but me. God, send someone else to bless them. Send someone else to comfort them. Send someone else to encourage them. Send someone else to help them. Send someone else to love them. Send someone else to minister to them. Send someone else to listen to them. Send someone else to pray with them. Send someone else to serve them. God, send someone else to invite them to church. God, send someone else to tell them about Jesus. This is not the right answer, but it is our real answer at times. This is another example of why we desperately need the amazing, delivering, freeing, forgiving, loving, rescuing, saving, transforming grace of God all the time, amen? We need it all the time. Moses was in a dark place. And so God now responds to Moses again. Verse 14, then the Lord's anger burned against Moses. And he said, isn't Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. And also he is on the way now to meet you. He will rejoice when he sees you. I want us to identify real quickly three traits of God that we see here in this passage. Three traits of God that he revealed to Moses in his response to Moses in this passage. And there are three traits of God that are true in his relationship with you and me today. The first trait we see is God's anger. God said go, Moses said no. The Lord's anger burned against Moses in the burning bush. God was not pleased with the disobedience of Moses. God was not pleased with the lack of faith from Moses. Remember, God is a loving God. He loves us. He's with us. He knows what's best for us. He wants what's best for us. He always does what is best for us. God's a jealous God. The scriptures remind us that God is a jealous God. God doesn't want you or me or Moses to give our allegiance, our love, our praise, our worship to false idols, to worthless gods. God wants us to believe him, to trust him, and to go with him by faith in him because that's always what's best for us. The words to the old hymn remind us of this truth. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And so as we see with Moses, we see with ourselves, God disciplines us for our disobedience and sin against him. God takes our disobedience and sin seriously. He took it seriously with Moses. He takes our sin and disobedience seriously as well. Now, God is not subject to the swings of emotion and the power of emotions like we are. 
God, in his response to us, even in those moments when his anger burns against us, God is always holy and just and righteous in his response to us because our God is a holy, just, and righteous God. So God's response to our sin of disobedience is holy, just, and righteous because that's who he is. God is also slow to anger, abounding in love, grace, mercy, and forgiveness for us in Christ Jesus. This is good news for us. He abounds in his love and his grace and his forgiveness for us in Christ Jesus. He's slow to anger, which we'll see here in just a moment. And so we understand this. When it comes to God's anger, God's anger is always righteous. His anger is always righteous, and God always expresses his righteous anger righteously. God's anger is always righteous. He's right. He's holy. He's just. But secondarily, God always expresses his righteous anger righteously. And we'll see this with the next trait of God. We see God's anger. Second, we see God's patience. We see God's patience. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said, isn't Aaron the Levite your brother? We see his patience. God's patience literally took the baton from God's anger. So we see God's anger, the first leg, and hands the baton to God's patience. God's anger hand of the baton to God's patience. This in and of itself is a testimony to the greatness of God. Think with me about our lives. Your life, certainly my life, I can think about this and apply it to myself. Whether my anger is righteous or unrighteous, more often than not, it's fleshly, it's unrighteous, but whether my anger is righteous or unrighteous, whether it's righteous as a result of anger due to sin and injustice, or whether it's unrighteous as a result of something done to me that I just didn't happen to like, oftentimes, myself, and I'm sure you're probably similar to me, we have a hard time expressing our righteous anger righteously. Whether it's righteous or unrighteous, our anger, most of the time what we do is we express it unrighteously. Which what happens and what does that mean? It means this. We usually say and do things that we wish we wouldn't have said and done. Because we realize then, uh-oh, my anger has just made this worse, not better. God, notice, don't miss this, God's anger, his righteous anger, handed the baton to his patience, God asked Moses another rhetorical question. God asked Moses, Moses, isn't Aaron the Levite your brother? Now we know God's anger got the attention of Moses. I would say it would probably get my attention and I think you probably agree. God makes it clear when he's not happy with me, and I, there's no mistake in it. We know God's anger got the attention of Moses because for the rest of chapter 4, Moses doesn't respond again to God. If you read all the way through it in chapter 4, there's not another word from Moses. Moses doesn't answer God. He doesn't respond to God. From this point for the rest of chapter 4, God speaks, Moses listens, and Moses obeys. And so what God did with his patience, once again with Moses, he shared some important information with Moses in this passage in verse 14. First, we know that God shared with Moses, God told Moses, hey, Aaron is alive. Remember, Moses had been shepherding sheep in Midian far away from Egypt in the wilderness for the past 40 years. Moses was separated from family and friends. He wasn't more than likely even aware whether or not Aaron was still alive. And so when God started to share in verse 14 with Moses, his plan for Moses, God told Moses, hey, Aaron is alive. God also told Moses, Aaron speaks well. He reminded Moses, isn't Aaron your brother, the Levite? Isn't he a Levite? The Levites were from the priestly tribe of Israel. They were educated. They were trained in the law. They were teachers of the law. So they were 
well equipped for speech. They spoke well. They were eloquent. God also told Moses, Aaron is on the way. He said, hey, Moses, I want you to know, I'm sending Aaron to meet with you. He's on the way. Your brother, who you have not seen for at very minimum 40 years, is on the way to you. And then God told Moses, Aaron will be glad. When Aaron meets you, Moses, understand this, Aaron's going to rejoice. He's going to rejoice. And we know and can surmise that Moses would also rejoice upon that reunion with Aaron. And so we see God's anger and we see God's patience immediately with Moses, continuing, as we've seen in our study, with Moses. We too, I think, can all rejoice today that God is a patient God. Amen? Oh, he's so patient. He's so long-suffering with you and with me. I know without a shadow of a doubt, I test his patience on a daily basis. I know. I know, you know, as we raise our kids, at times we'll tell them, you're testing me. What does that mean? It means they're pushing. They're pushing. They're pressing. And we're doing everything to handle our righteous anger righteously. I'm well aware that no doubt I... I test the patience of God, and yet his patience abounds. He's long suffering. He's slow to anger. Praise God, he abounds in faithful love. And so we see God's anger. We know that he takes sin and disobedience seriously. We see his patience. He speaks clearly, and his anger is always expressed righteously. He's patient with us, long suffering with us. But we also, third, see God's grace. I want you to see God's grace. Let's look and continue in verse 15. God continues and says, you will speak with him, that meaning Aaron, and tell him what to say. I will help both of you and him to speak and will teach you both what to say. He will speak to the people for you. He will serve as a mouth for you and you will serve as God to him. And so we see here God's grace with Moses, God's grace on Moses was evident throughout this passage. It's been evident throughout our study. It was a grace from God that Moses survived the Lord's anger against him. It was a grace from God that Moses received the patience of God in his response to him. And so we see God now continues his dialogue with Moses, God speaking, Moses listening, and God is clear with Moses, no misunderstandings from Moses, no way for Moses to miss out on what God is saying to him. God, in this passage, in verses 15 and 16, God used the word will seven times. This will happen, this will happen, this will happen. The message, again, was being reinforced. It's being reinforced all the way from chapter one to chapter four as we've made our way through in this study. And it continues to be reinforced here as we get to the end. Look at what Moses said. You will speak with him. You will tell him what to say. I will help both you and him to speak. I will teach you both what to say. He will speak to the people for you. He will serve as a mouth for you and you will serve as God to him. God was letting Moses know this is going to happen. Three graces. I want you to see three graces from God to Moses right here. Three graces from God to Moses. Number one, the first grace, God gave Moses his messenger. God sent Aaron to Moses to speak for Moses. Remember, this is a key point. Moses was not unable to speak. Moses was unwilling to speak. Moses was not unable to speak. Moses was unwilling to speak. He said, God, I've never been eloquent. God, please send someone else. So God sent Aaron to Moses. Aaron was a good speaker. Aaron was eloquent. Aaron was very persuasive. We'll talk, touch base on that in just a moment. And so Aaron, God told Moses, Aaron will serve as your mouthpiece, your spokesman. Aaron will speak to the people for you. Aaron will be your messenger, Moses. And we know today the Holy Spirit of God is our messenger from God. God speaks to us by his Holy Spirit in us. God speaks to us by his Holy Spirit in us through his word, through prayer, through our circumstances, and through one another. But make no mistake about it, as followers of Jesus Christ, God is the one who speaks to us by his Spirit in us. 
And so God has given each one of us a messenger because we desperately need God's help to live God's way. We need God's help to love God's way. And so just as God gave a grace to Moses, God gave Moses his messenger. God has given us his messenger, the Holy Spirit. Second grace, God gave Moses his message. God immediately told Moses here, I'm going to use you, Moses. I know you're reluctant, Moses. I know you're being disobedient right now, Moses. I'm going to use you, Moses. I'm going to bless you. Moses, you will serve as God to Aaron. That's what God told Moses. You will serve as God to Aaron. What was God sharing with Moses there? Here's what God was saying. Moses, I'm going to speak with you. And I'm going to tell you everything you need to know. As I've been promising you, I'm going to do that. And then Moses, you will tell Aaron everything I say to you. And then Aaron will speak to the people and tell the people what I want the people to know. God was teaching Moses and Aaron, literally, what it meant to be a prophet of God. A prophet of God is someone who speaks God's words to God's people and God's strength for God's glory. And so God said to Moses, you are going to serve as God to Aaron and Aaron will be your mouthpiece. We know as followers of Jesus Christ, God has given us his message, his word, his gospel that we are to share with one another and with all those God places around us. And so we see these graces from God to Moses. We see them from God to us as well. The third grace is God also gave Moses his muscle. God gave him his messenger, his message in his muscle. Look in verse 17. And take this staff in your hand that you will perform the signs with. Remember the staff that Moses had, the staff of God that Moses had was a reminder, a symbol of the presence and power of God. As God performed the miracles through Moses with the staff, it pointed people to God, not Moses. The staff was a reminder, a physical reminder to Moses. The staff in his hand, as otherwise known as the rod of God, the staff in his hand was a physical reminder to Moses. Moses, you are weak, but God is strong. Holy Spirit of God who dwells within us is a reminder to you and me that we are weak, but God, he is strong. And so we see the grace of God on Moses. The grace of God with Moses was evident throughout this passage. It's been evident throughout our study. The grace of God with us, the grace of God on us is evident throughout our lives. God's grace is evident to you and to me. And I hope you recognize that. I hope you see the grace of God at work in your life and on your life. Literally everything we do, every step we take is a gift of the grace of God to us. So Paul said, by the grace of God, I am able to go and do all that God's called me to do. God's grace is sufficient for us and his power is perfected in our weakness. And so we see God's anger He takes sin and disobedience seriously. We see God's patience. He's long-suffering. He's slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiveness and grace and mercy to us. And we see God's grace. Once again, God had made it clear to Moses, I am still going to use you, Moses. I'm going to do what I've been saying I am going to do. And Moses, you're going to be a part. I'm going to help you, Moses. And so we see these traits of God at work in our lives as well on a day-by-day basis. So what's our application today? What is our application? What's your application? What's my application? What can we take away and put into practice in our lives? Let me just share five quick lessons that we need to apply in our lives from Moses. Five quick lessons that we've seen throughout this study that we can apply in our lives today and this week. First lesson, God has a plan for us. God had a plan for Moses and God has a plan for you and God has a plan for me. Listen, please do not allow your circumstances. Don't allow what others say. Don't allow what others do. Don't allow the discouragement or disappointment that you are dealing with. Don't allow the fact that you may have turned away from God and walked away from God to hide, to block the fact that God has a plan for you. He has a plan for you. He had a plan for Moses. He has a plan for you as his child. Paul told us, for it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. As God makes us more like Jesus, his purpose for us is to go and make disciples for Jesus. 
Now, God's purpose for us, God's got a plan for you, God's got a plan for me. Listen, God's plan for us is clear. We're to go and make disciples for Jesus. We're to baptize others just like we did Taryn. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We're to teach others to obey and observe the word of God, which is exactly what we're doing. We're teaching us to obey what God has commanded us in his word. We are to deny ourselves, take up our cross daily, and follow Jesus. We are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, knowing that as we do, he will take care of us. He will add everything to us. Our plan from God for you and for me is clear. But secondarily, God's plan for us is unique. It's unique. God is a creative God. His plan for you and me is unique. Listen, God has given every one of us abilities, skills, talents, and personalities. Praise God, they're all different. Amen? He's given all of us different abilities, skills, talents, personalities. He's given us different spiritual gifts. And he's done all that because he's divinely designed you to minister to the congregation he's put around you. And he's done that with me to divinely design me to the minister to the congregation he's put around me. As followers of Jesus, we're ministers for Jesus. Now, there is overlapping in our congregations. Why do I say that? Because we're all part of one another's congregation. You're part of my congregation, I'm part of your congregation. But there is more to our congregations than just us. God has placed and extended your congregation to all those he places around you as you go about your day-to-day life. You've got folks in your congregation that aren't a part of my congregation. I got folks in my congregation that aren't a part of your congregation. But here's the reality. God's plan for us is clear. God's plan for us is unique. God has divinely designed you to minister to your congregation. To shine his light to those he places around you. To be that minister to those around you. Which I think is just awesome. It's amazing. And then God's plan for us is best. God's plan for us is best because God knows his best and he loves us most. And God's plan for us is much better than our plan for us. Every day of the week and twice on Sunday, much better than our plan for us. Second lesson, God has a plan for us. Second lesson, God's with us. When God saved us, he placed his Holy Spirit in us. God is with us by his Holy Spirit in us. We are never alone. I am never alone. Say that with me out loud. I am never alone. I am never, ever alone. Say that with me out loud. I am never, ever alone. I am never, ever, ever alone. Say that with me out loud. I am never, ever, ever alone. Do you get the picture? We're never alone. God is with us every step of our way, every moment of our day. When we are in the middle of conflict, God is with us as the Prince of Peace, ready to help bring peace into that conflict. When we are dealing with difficult news, God is that minister of grace to us that is with us. His grace is sufficient for us, and his power is perfected in our weakness. When we are in surgery, we're having medical procedures done to us. God is with us as the great physician, and he is guiding the doctor's hands. He is guiding the nurse's hands. He is giving the skill to those who will be taking care of us. When we are dealing with weakness in our personal person. God is with us and he is, his power is being perfected in our weakness. When we're dealing with sorrow and grief and loss of loved ones, our God is with us and he is the father of compassion, the God of all mercies. And he's with us, comforting us in our trouble and our trials and our hurts and our sorrows so that we can then turn around and comfort those with the comfort he has given to us. When we don't know how we're going to be able to move forward, when we don't know what's next for us, when we don't feel like we can take another step, our God is with us and he is empowered empowering us to continue to take those steps of faith. He is at work in us. He is at work through us. He will continue to make a way for us. We know and understand that God is with us. God is with us by his spirit in us. We're never alone. Give the Lord a hand. Give the Lord a hand. Give the Lord a hand. He's with us. He's with you and he's with me. He's with us right now. He's teaching us this word. And he is applying this word particularly to you and to me in different ways. Now, the Holy Spirit, his presence in us means strength. As Jesus told us, for you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. 
The Holy Spirit brings us strength. The Holy Spirit brings us success. Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will be my witnesses. Success is guaranteed for us because our almighty God is with us. Success is guaranteed for us in God's plan for us. Not our plan for us. God's plan for us. Third, God disciplines those he loves. One of the things we see in this testimony of Moses, in this episode in his life as we've been studying through the first four chapters of Exodus, is God disciplines those he loves. God disciplined Moses for his disobedience and sin. You say, well, how? Well, I'll tell you how. Moses missed out on being the sole spokesman and representative to the elders of Israel, to the Israelites, and to Pharaoh because of his sin of disobedience. He missed out on being the sole spokesman. The unwillingness of Moses to go with God opened the way for Aaron to come into the picture. God sent Aaron to Moses to help Moses because of the unwillingness of Moses to go with God when God said to. But get this now, you know this as well as I do. Aaron helped Moses, but Aaron also brought problems and difficulties for Moses. One example, just one example, there were others. This is a sermon in and of itself. One example, do you remember Aaron speaks well? You remember he, he, he's eloquent? He's persuasive in his speech? Yeah, he was. Because you remember Aaron was the one who persuaded the Israelites to bow down and worship the golden calf. Aaron used his eloquence and his persuasion of speech. And he was the one who led Israel while Moses was on Mount Sinai, the mountain of God, speaking to God, getting the truth from God, the word from God, the law from God. Moses was engulfed up on the mountain of God and down below, here's old Aaron leading the Israelites into idolatry. And get this, that was shortly after God freed Israel from bondage in Egypt, part of the Red Sea, and all the Israelites walked through the Red Sea on dry ground. Aaron caused problems for Moses. Aaron also, I'll give you another one. I just can't, can't resist. He spoke against Moses. It's an age-old problem in the scriptures. We see it today. Those closest to us will speak against us. And what they say isn't always truth. When they speak against us, it can be guaranteed it's not true. Aaron did it with Moses. Jesus chose 12 disciples. 12 men walked and talked and met with Jesus. Can't get any better than that. One of them betrayed him. One of them spoke against him. I think that's instructive certainly to me. I think it's instructive to all of us. If it happened with Moses, if it happened with Jesus, the Son of God, God the Son, oh, it's going to happen. It'll happen. Those close to us speak against us. But we know, as Moses knew, God's our defender, and God will take care of each and every one of those circumstances. Listen, God disciplines those he loves. He did it with Moses. He does it with us. God disciplines us. He convicts us. He disciplines us by his spirit in us. And he does it because he loves us. And God's conviction is always clear. It's always loving. It's always right. And it's always on time. God knows sin is never good for us. Sin breaks our fellowship with God. I like what someone once said. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. And there's truth with that. That's why God disciplines us, because he loves us. That's why we discipline our kids, because we love them. 
God disciplines us because he loves us, his kids. Fourth lesson we see here is God will fulfill his plan. God will fulfill his plan. This is just shouts out from the passage to us, uh, both here with Moses and with us. Though Moses got off to a, a rough start, it was a start of sin and disobedience, all the questions, all the objections, Moses went with Aaron to the elders of Israel. Moses went with Aaron to Pharaoh. Moses delivered Israel from bondage in Egypt. Moses saw God part the waters of the Red Sea. Moses walked through the Red Sea on dry ground. Moses saw God do exactly what God said he would do, and he used Moses to do it. God will fulfill his plan with or without us. He will fulfill his plan. God invites us to join him in his work of changing lives for eternity. As followers of Jesus, we are ministers for Jesus and we are witnesses for Jesus. And when we join God in his work, we see the power of God and we reap the blessings of God as we follow God by faith. That's what God wanted for Moses. It's what he wants for you and for me. And we join God in fulfilling his plan for us as we give and grow and go. As Al mentioned earlier, God's vision for our church family is to glorify God as fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ as we make disciples of all nations. That's all well and good. How do we do it? We do it as we give and grow and go. We give our time, talents, and treasures to God. We glorify God. We grow into fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ as we get into the word of God. And then we go for God to those around us and those far from us and tell them the good news about Jesus. When we choose not to give, when we choose not to grow, when we choose not to go, we all lose. We all lose. You lose, I lose. Because we're family. And we're called to give, grow, and go. We're called to fulfill God's plan together as brothers and sisters in Christ. And then we see the fifth lesson that we learn from Moses that we see at work in us today is God wants faith from us. God's plan for us always calls for faith from us. It's impossible for us to please God apart from faith in God. God wants us to live each day of our lives open and available to him in every way. God wants us to say, God, here I am, send me. God, here I am, use me. God, here I am, you lead, I will follow. God, here I am, have your way in me, with me, and through me and around me. And the evidence of our faith in God is our obedience to God. We show our faith in God and our love for God by our obedience to God. God desires faith from us. He is a faithful God. He does what he says he will do. Amen? Exodus 4. Turn with me. Look at verse 27. Now watch this. Now the Lord had said to Aaron, go and meet Moses in the wilderness. So we went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. Moses told Aaron everything the Lord had said to him and sent him to say and about all the signs he had commanded him to do. And then Moses and Aaron went and assembled all the elders of Israel, of the Israelites. Aaron repeated everything the Lord had said to Moses and performed the signs before the people. The people believed and when they heard that the Lord had paid attention to them and that he had seen their misery, they knelt low and worshiped. Say that with me. And again, they knelt low and worshiped. God did everything he said he would do in, with, and through Moses and Israel. The response of Moses and Israel was to worship God, to bow in his presence to give him the glory the honor and the praise as once again they were reminded that God knows them that God hears them that God sees them God loves them that God is with them God will do everything he says he will do in you with you through you and around you, and to do the same with me. And our response to God on a day-by-day -day basis is to worship God, to give him the praise, honor, and glory that he 
is due. Because once again, day by day, we see that God sees us, that God hears us, that God loves us, that God is with us, and that God will take care of us. All God asked from Moses was to go. Go with me by faith. What God asked from you and me once again this morning is simply to go. Go with him by faith. God is in us. God is with us. God is for us. So let's go with God today. Let me ask you to bow in prayer. Our worship team's coming and leading in this time of response to God. Oftentimes, the response is to bow before the Lord and, and to present our request to Him, to encourage one another to respond in obedience to Him. That's what God desires for each of us every time we respond to Him. In particular this morning, I want to encourage you just to respond in worship of the Lord. As we see Moses and Israel, as they gather together, and as they knelt low and worship the Lord, what a great way for us to respond to God today, just to simply kneel and to bow and to bend our knees, maybe right there where you're seated, maybe come near to the altar, and just to bend your knee before the Lord, and to give Him worship, to give Him praise, to give Him thanks for His grace, for His provision, for His power, for His presence, for His promises, for His reassurances. For the reality, the truth that you know by faith that he is with you and he's not going to leave you and he will do what he says he will do in you, with you, for you, through you, and around you. He is a faithful God, a God who keeps all his promises. Our pastors and ministers will be standing here at the front. They would love to pray with you, pray for you. If you've got a burden, care, concern, we'd love to pray with you. Pray for you. We don't want you to leave carrying the same burden you entered our worship center carrying. Salvation. Today is the day of salvation. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, listen, why not today? Why not here? Right here? Why not right now? We would love to introduce you to Jesus. He paid the price for your sin. He took your place on the cross. He died on the cross. He was buried in the tomb. On the third day, he rose again. He is alive today. He defeated sin and death for you and for me. And the only way we are able to enter a relationship with God is through faith and trust in Jesus and his work on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection that opens a way for us to receive forgiveness of sins and to be made right with God by faith in the Son of God, Jesus. We'd love to help you say yes to Jesus. It's an opportunity for us to go and minister to those that God's placed around us, pray with and pray for one another. Let's stand and let's respond to the Lord in obedience to his command.